The Diggs family murders, a harrowing tale of loss and mystery, left me grappling with profound sadness and an avid desire for answers. As I dove into the details of this case, I struggled to imagine the profound sorrow and the enduring impact of this event on the two communities, Harlem and Teaneck, that at the time were undoubtedly worlds apart. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious, here at Odd Mysteries Stories. Wesley Diggs was not your everyday man. He was a tall, slender figure known well in Harlem, not just for his stature, but for his entrepreneurial spirit. A college graduate and a former standout basketball player, Wesley had brains and brawn. But what really set him apart was his ambition. This drive led him to own several bars in Harlem and even a stationary store. Can you imagine juggling all that? Wesley did, often working up to 18 hours a day. Now, Wesley's life was a whirlwind of business ventures, with his two Harlem taverns, Diggs Den and the Cafe Lounge, taking up much of his time. But it wasn't just work that kept him away from home. Wesley's personal life was complicated, to say the least, with mistresses and long hours contributing to his frequent absences from his family home in Teaneck, New Jersey. It was on a cold Saturday afternoon in December 1975, specifically December 6th, that Wesley made his way back home after three days away. With the anniversary of Pearl Harbor the next day and Christmas just around the corner, one can only imagine the thoughts racing through his mind. Gifts for his four children, perhaps. The youngest, Roger, was just five years old, prime age for big wheel dreams and G.I. Joe adventures. But Wesley's mind might have also been on his bars back in Harlem. The holiday season meant patrons would be expecting a little extra cheer and decoration. Known for his love of jazz, Maybe Wesley was listening to John Coltrane's My Favorite Things as he drove, a tune that might have brought a momentary escape from the pressures of his light. Approaching his quiet neighborhood on Carlton Terrace, Wesley would have turned down the music, mindful of not wanting to disturb the peace or draw unnecessary attention to himself. The festive decorations on neighboring houses, with images of Santa and reindeer, stood in stark contrast to the darkness that awaited him at home. This story steeped in the realities of Wesley Diggs' life, sets the stage for a tragedy that would shake the community. As we delve deeper, remember, this is a tale of a man caught between worlds, the bright lights of Harlem's nightlife and the quiet suburban life in Teaneck. What do you think was going through Wesley's mind during that drive home? In 1970, Wesley Diggs, a Harlem businessman, along with his wife Jean, made a pivotal move to Teaneck, New Jersey, marking a significant change for their family. They were the Trailblazers, the first African-American family in their new neighborhood. Yet, the Diggsies were met with warmth and soon became integral members of their community. Their daughter Audrey, aged 19, a teenage star athlete, was a source of pride, often cheered on at her games by her siblings Allison, aged 16, Wesley Jr., aged 12, and the youngest, Roger, aged five years old, alongside their mother, Jean. The tranquility of this close-knit family life was shattered on a cold afternoon on December 6, 1975. Wesley, returning from a grueling work schedule, was met with an unimaginable scene. Audrey was found, quote, hurt in her bedroom, leading Wesley to a desperate search for help as he discovered the house phone was dead. His pleas for assistance echoed through the neighborhood, shouting, my daughter's been hurt, Call an ambulance, a frantic request to his neighbor Edward Murphy. The gravity of the situation quickly unfolded as a nurse, one of Murphy's daughters, rushed to the Diggs residence. The immediate realization of Audrey's fate left her shaken and pale, uttering the chilling words to her sister Mary, she's dead, she's dead. But the horror didn't end there. The discovery of the other family members' bodies throughout the house painted a grim picture of the tragedy that had befallen the Diggs family. Jean Diggs, aged 39, the wife and mother, had been described as a charming woman who had recently become an Avon representative. She was a beautiful woman in every way, stunning to look at, kind and gentle, devoted her life to her family, said Frances Mayers, one neighbor, told the local news. They called the police. As the house was searched, the bodies of the other four family members were found. Jean was lying dead on a powdered bench in the basement recreation room and had been shot in both the forehead and the chest. Audrey was shot 
three times in the head and twice in the back. Wesley Jr. and Roger were both found lying face down on top of the bed inside Roger's room. Wesley Jr. was shot three times in the back of the head, while Roger was shot twice. Allison slept in the attic and was found murdered in her bed. She was lying on her side and had been shot twice in the back of the head. Additional bullet holes were discovered in the walls of the attic, the two bedrooms, and the recreation room. The investigation revealed a puzzling scene, 26 spent shell casings, but no clear signs of a break-in or struggle. It seemed as if the world outside remained oblivious to the tragedy within, with no reports of gunshots or disturbances. The family, partially dressed in pajamas, indicated the murders likely occurred in the still of the night between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. This harrowing event left the community and the nation grappling with numerous questions. How could such a tragedy unfold without a whisper of warning? What motives lie behind this act of violence? And how does a community heal from such a profound loss? In the heart-wrenching aftermath of the Diggs family tragedy, the community's response was a poignant testament to the depth of their collective grief and the strength of their solidarity. The journey from autopsy to final farewell was marked by a series of deeply moving rituals that brought together a diverse cross-section of the communities, each step laden with sorrow and respect. Following the autopsies, the bodies of the Diggs family were taken to Benta's funeral home in Harlem. This place, situated just a few blocks from Diggs Den, Wesley's own bar became a site of communal mourning. The sight of the five caskets laid out together was a sorrowful spectacle that etched itself into the memories of all who bore witness, a visual representation of the magnitude of the loss. The funeral service, held in the Presbyterian Church of Teaneck, New Jersey, was a profound gathering that transcended the confines of the church itself. Despite the relentless rain that poured down, the church swelled with the presence of over 500 attendees, filling every available space. An additional 350 people listened from a meeting room, and outside, a resilient crowd stood in the rain, their attention fixed on the service broadcast through a loudspeaker. It was in this sacred space that Reverend Chase invoked the comforting words of the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, offering a glimmer of solace amidst the overwhelming grief. Wesley, accompanied by his mother and two brothers, was enveloped by a community in mourning. The scene was a poignant reflection of the diverse ties the Diggs family had formed, with many friends and strangers alike shedding tears for their loss. The local newspaper captured the unity and diversity of the mourners, expressing surprise at the equal blending of black and white evident in the 40 young ushers, classmates of the Diggs children from Teaneck High School, who formed a cordon of honor outside the church. Music, with its profound ability to touch the heart, played a significant role in the service. The tearful strains of Gladys Knight's Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me, a song Wesley had cherished with his wife Jean, filled the air, adding a deeply personal layer to the farewell. In a moment of raw vulnerability, a family friend, Arthur Symes, read a statement from Wesley that spoke directly to the soul. I am a better person for having been exposed to you. I gave you shelter and now... I ask each of you to forgive me for not sheltering you in your greatest hour of need and to give me the strength to go on without you. Wesley's motionless presence in the pew, as reported by the local newspaper, was a silent testament to the depth of his pain. The solemn procession to the burial site at George Washington Memorial Park in Paramus, New Jersey, was marked by the silent tribute of over 90 cars, their headlights a somber beacon in the gloom. It was here in the finality of the burial that Wesley's composure faltered and the dam of his grief broke. Decades later, the memory of that day and its impact on Wesley was poignantly captured by Bruce Morgan in a Harlem History Facebook group post. I don't ever remember seeing Wes smile after that day. This reflection underscores the enduring shadow cast by such profound loss, a reminder of the fragility of joy in the wake of tragedy. Wesley Diggs, the patriarch, found himself at the center of a swirl of suspicion and speculation within the community. Despite not being home on the fateful night and subsequently passing a lie detector test, whispers circulated that perhaps Wesley knew more about the murders than he had revealed to the authorities. 
Wesley's own account of that night placed him far from the scene. He had spent the evening with his girlfriend in the Bronx following a political rally at his bar, Diggs Den. The grim task of processing the crime scene left a haunting image. The bodies of his family members were bagged, tagged, and Wesley never set foot in that house again. Richard Kaczynski, the lead investigator on the case, harbored suspicions of a revenge killing aimed at Wesley, a theory that Wesley staunchly denied, maintaining his full cooperation with the investigation. His personal life, marred by extramarital affairs, was thrust into the spotlight, revealing a strained but enduring relationship with his wife Jean, who, according to Wesley, had begrudgingly accepted his infidelities. The day following the tragedy saw Wesley engaging in routine activities, meeting with his accountant and collecting cash receipts from his bars before making the somber journey back to Teaneck. Despite passing a polygraph test and not being formally considered a suspect, some investigators remained skeptical, suspecting Wesley might have withheld information. Wesley's financial struggles added another layer of complexity to the investigation. Heavily indebted from running four bars, Wesley had secured a mortgage on his house and borrowed over $100,000, repaying the loan in weekly installments. Although life insurance policies were in place for Jean and the children, Wesley stood to gain a relatively modest sum of just $6,500 from their deaths, casting doubt on financial motive theories. The investigation also delved into the possibility of Wesley making enemies through his bars, where narcotics trafficking was a known issue. Wesley admitted to ejecting drug dealers from his establishments on occasion, but no criminal charges linked to these incidents ever materialized, and a thorough investigation into Wesley's background revealed no ties to narcotics or criminal activities. In the aftermath, Wesley distanced himself from the tragedy both physically and emotionally. He moved into a Manhattan apartment, relinquished control of his bars to his brother, and became a vocal critic of the investigation's focus on him. The stress of the ordeal took a significant toll on his health, leading to numerous health issues, including minor strokes, and ultimately a fatal heart attack in October 1987 at the age of 52. Wesley's frustration with the investigation was palpable. He had even requested FBI involvement, a plea that was denied. Wesley's death in 1987 marked the end of a life shadowed by unspeakable tragedy and marred by public suspicion. His final years were spent grappling with the loss of his family, the weight of unresolved questions, and disappointment in an investigation that, in his view, failed to bring him and his family justice. As the years passed, the Diggs family murder case remained an enigmatic puzzle, attracting various theories from different investigators, each adding layers to an already complex mystery. Among these, a theory proposed by a New York police detective named James Vitti stood out, suggesting a narrative divergent from others, a robbery gone awry. Detective Vitti's theory hinged on the testimony of an informant, Tecumseh Robinson, known to frequent one of Wesley's bars. Robinson pointed the finger at a convicted murderer and his girlfriend as the culprits behind the Diggs family's demise. According to Robinson, the motive was robbery. The pair believed Wesley stored the cash receipts from his bars within his Teaneck home. He further claimed that Jean Diggs, familiar with the female suspect, unwittingly allowed the deadly duo into her home, leading to the tragic outcome. Robinson's credibility was initially bolstered by his passing of a polygraph test, prompting the NYPD to compensate him for his information and equip him with a wire for further surveillance. However, the reliability of Robinson's account soon came into question when he vanished after entering a Harlem bar, leaving behind only a smashed microphone in his car, effectively evading police efforts to locate him thereafter. Wesley Diggs, confronted with Robinson's allegations, refuted the claim that he kept substantial sums of money at home. He further denied any acquaintance with the woman implicated by Robinson, expressing doubt that Jean would have known her either. This theory despite its initial intrigue, ultimately foundered due to a lack of corroborative evidence, remaining one of the many speculative narratives surrounding the tragic and unresolved case. The Diggs family murder case, already shrouded in mystery and speculation, was further complicated by a second theory, this one posited by Teaneck Police Lieutenant Fred Green. This theory ventured into territory previously dismissed by the initial investigation, 
suggesting a narrative of murder-suicide with an unexpected twist. Lieutenant Green proposed that Gene Diggs, overwhelmed by a confluence of personal challenges, was responsible for the deaths of her children before turning the gun on herself. The absence of the weapon at the crime scene led Green to speculate that an unidentified individual, happening upon a gravely injured Gene, took it upon themselves to administer a fatal shot, thereby ensuring her death. This person then purportedly concealed the murder weapon, casting the appearance of an external assailant to preserve Gene's reputation. Green anchored his theory on several pieces of evidence and observations. Number one, Gene's alleged depression. Wesley had noted Gene's growing despondency in the months preceding the tragedy, exacerbated by his frequent absences and the loss of her father. A remark Jean purportedly made to a friend a week before the murders, where she said my family would be better off in God's hands, was cited as indicative of her distressed state of mind. Number two, the missing twenty two caliber gun, a gun that Jean reportedly kept in the kitchen for protection was unaccounted for, adding yet another layer of intrigue to the theory. Number three, Diary entries. An examination of both Jean and Audrey's diaries suggested a strained mother-daughter relationship, leading to speculation about a fatal altercation between the two of them. Number four, there were forensic discrepancies. The absence of gunpowder residue around Jean's chest wound, contrasted with its presence around the forehead wound and on Jean's pants, was presented as evidence of the two shots being fired under different circumstances. Number five, a pillow and pillowcase. There is the unexplained absence of a pillow from Audrey's bed and the discovery of an empty pillowcase, coupled with the presence of a white substance near Jean's chest wound and in areas with bullet damage to the walls. This evidence led Green to surmise that a pillow was used to muffle the sound of the shots fired by the alleged third party. Green believed this third party was responsible for the additional shots and the disposal of the murder weapon, actions intended to simulate an attack by an outsider. Although he claimed to have an idea of who this individual might be, he did not publicize their identity, and most importantly, he did not suspect Wesley. Wesley Diggs, for his part, expressed considerable doubt regarding Green's theory, which, like others before it, was never conclusively proven. The Diggs family murders with their complex web of theories and enduring questions, remains officially unsolved, leaving a lingering shadow of uncertainty and speculation over the case. Twelve years after the tragic loss of his family, Wesley Diggs faced his own demise, not from unresolved grief or the weight of suspicion, but from a sudden and fatal heart attack. In 1987, Wesley's life ended abruptly in front of his candy supply store on Maycomb's place in Harlem, a stark and unceremonious conclusion to a life marred by tragedy and health struggle. At the age of 52, he collapsed on the sidewalk, dying instantly in a neighborhood that had once been the center of his entrepreneurial spirit. Nearly half a century has passed since the Diggs family was brutally murdered, and in that time Harlem has undergone profound transformation. The bar that Wesley once owned, Diggs Den, has been replaced by a Duane Reed drugstore now, sitting beneath a luxury apartment building. The corners of Harlem that once hosted informal cannabis sales and were dotted with vacant lots and derelict buildings have seen a wave of gentrification giving rise to coffee shops like Starbucks and upscale condominiums. The social dynamics of the area have shifted dramatically with newcomers freely enjoying spaces like Jackie Robinson Park, spaces that, in Wesley's time, were avoided by the prudent locals after dark, back when it was known as Colonial Park. Despite these sweeping changes, one constant remains, the mystery of the Diggs family murders. The case, steeped in theories, speculation, and the shadow of an unsolved crime, remains open, a haunting reminder of a family tragedy that shook a community. As I reach the conclusion of the Diggs family's murder story, I hope I have shared a complete tapestry of memories, theories, and unanswered questions. The passage of time has transformed Harlem and left a lingering question with the people of Teaneck, New Jersey. But the shadow of this unsolved case lingers, a somber reminder of the fragility of life and the quest for justice. In remembering the Diggs family, I want to honor their legacy and the unresolved pain that accompanies their memory hoping for a day when truth brings closure to this enduring mystery.
I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.